Um, Ronan and I have been working together for about a year now trying to find new ways of integrating poetry and music. The basic idea being that poetry is as much an oral as it is a written form. And I suppose even more than that, the idea is that if we can integrate the two properly, both in performance and in recording, it may be possible to stimulate people towards multiple listenings or multiple readings of poems in a way that's unlikely to happen when the primary encounter between a reader and a poem is through the uh, encounter with the printed page. And it would seem a fairly obvious development from that and the most natural thing in the world perhaps that you would uh, pair a traditional music piece with a poem in the Irish language. You have an ancient language and an antique instrument. Ronan's pipes are 200 years old and what could be more organic and wholesome and Celtic than that? Um, the difficulty is with this particular poem we're going to do um, that it's not a traditional poem. It happens to be written in the Irish language, but it's attempting at least to be a modern poem which is in dispute partly with its own tradition. So the poem touches on traditional imagery and it touches on traditional language in places which justifies bringing the music in. But the relationship between the two is a relationship of tension, uh, a dynamic tension we hope. Um, there's a counterpoint between the spoken word, we hope at least, and the music, but it's a counterpoint based as much on contradiction as it is on agreement. Um, the poem is called Nur Hanigan Rhe Er Kurt, uh, which translates as when the wind came to visit, and the wind is, of course, feminine in the Irish language. I could have sworn the outside door was locked when she came in without so much as a knock or by your leave and came up behind me where I sat in the corner arguing with myself, an old enemy I've never gotten the better of. One more time before she left me there forever, I felt her hurt breath on the back of my neck, her fragrant arms around me. Even if it had been you, sister, who had walked all night by the side of the sea and across the mountain path, the road slippery under your damaged feet and the hailstones of time pouring down between you and me, I couldn't have been any more shaken. I would have sworn that all the doors were locked in the long cloistered corridor that stretches as far as where you are in the furthest away cell in the broken monastery of forgetting. say that one of the reasons that I was interested in working with Ronan was not so much because of his quite formidable reputation as a traditional musician but more because of his curiosity about working with new technologies, uh, his openness to using um, beats and grooves and loops to programs of one kind or another, the idea that he would be just as happy playing um, a length of wavin pipe, which is the instrument you know has, uh, or a doorbell 
or, um, or, or an aerosol can, which you'll hear a little bit later, as he would uh, playing a tin whistle or a low flute or whatever. And the idea here is that there's still a kind of a resistance to technology in the area of poetry. It seems somehow inauthentic. And our idea is that it doesn't matter at all what it is that makes the sound, right? So long as it's the right note for the poem, which sets the tuning, really, for whatever it is that we're trying to do together. So that's the test. The integrity is set by, it's the integrity between the music and the spoken word, rather than the integrity of the instrument itself that's at issue here. So for the second piece we're going to do, um, this is our own favorite piece, I have to say. Um, the challenge here was that this is a poem which is an elegy for a great Scots Gaelic poet called Ian McElrowan or Ian Creighton Smith, one of the great Scottish writers of the 20th century. And the poem deliberately echoes his poem. So there are lines taken from his work that are integrated into the fabric of my poem as an act of homage to him. The difficulty is because we no longer share traditions. That might not be immediately apparent even to a very well-informed reader of either Scots Gaelic or Irish language writing. So how do you get that across then to somebody listening to the poem or reading the poem that his voice is somehow speaking through my voice and that that's intentional on my part. So that's one aspect of what we're trying to do here. And the other was we were trying to find some way of pulling back together again the Scots Gaelic and the Irish Gaelic traditions um, so that they're in conversation with each other around the conversation that is going on um, beyond the grave between the voice of this extraordinary dead poet and the particular poem that, uh, in which his words continue to live and breathe. So we're going to be joined for this piece by Nasreen El Safdi, who's going to sing one of the great uh, Scottish Gaelic laments, uh, a love poem, which is also um, a keen, I suppose, called Alan Down, which is translated into Irish. And uh, just to emphasize the point, when we were rehearsing here last week, uh, Nasreen told us that she first heard this song uh, on a computer game. <laughs> Per chance, by chance. <laughs> I think this argument that poets are eccentric tends to make them different from other people, which I think is very bad. I don't think poets are different from other people. Other people have uh, illuminations. They must have of their human beings. They must have illuminations of the same kind as poets have. In fact, some of them even have deeper ones, but they can't express them. I mean, they're not, poets are not different from people. They're just people.
She made him promise whatever his thirst, never to touch a drop in any croft or cottage where a hint of sickness may have lodged in cracked mugs or plates. As sickness spread like a malignant rumour, all powerful and invisible as the breath of God on the threshold of the world. seconds on to that clock, don't we, for the applause? <laughs> the applause. Um, well, now, just a, a quick word about uh, the technology we used. <laughs> Timer has been shut down. We're here for the night. <laughs> Lock the doors, quick. <laughs> uh, when we started off, I, it, it, it was a terrifying prospect for me. Uh, my comfort zone is those pipes playing old Irish music. I've, for years I've been messing around with computers and nasty drum beats and things like that, but that's where I'm happiest. And it was a bit of a roller coaster ride, a whirlwind at the same time. But I loved every minute of it and I'm always looking for challenges like that to knock me sideways. The way we started was that I recorded Louis in his front room, which is a lovely little sound in it, and brought them into my studio and then I got the big digital hose and I started spraying sounds at it. And at the, uh, at the stage then, I brought Louis in and the two of us worked together, chipping away at what was there, taking a lot of it back out. Um, you, know, you know the story of the, uh, the famous elephant sculptor who was interviewed and, and they, they were saying, how do, you, how do you get these incredible renditions, representations of, of elephants? And he was saying, I don't know, I just, I get a big hammer and I get the block of stone and I whack away all the bits that don't look like an elephant. <laughs> and that's what we were doing. You know, there's, there are no stowaways in our music. Everything that's there, we allowed it to stay. So um, another big challenge was to transfer from the studio to live. And uh, when I, I embarked on that, I had no idea would we be able to. But we managed, had to pick certain things that we'd have to trigger and certain things that we could do live. And this one we're going to do now, I'm going to accompany myself, I'm going to play the flute, accompanying me playing the pipes, accompanying Louis, speaking poetry. 
telling poetry. So, Louis. Uh, just to say the poem, we'll be doing it. It's, it's in Irish. Uh, it's called Unpaint Air, and the man who's speaking the poem uh, shares a house and a life with a woman who's a painter. And it's a well known fact that the aesthetics of painting are such that you cannot present reality as it really is. You have to knock it out of shape so it's almost unrecognisable as itself. And this man has noticed, noticed what the woman has done when she's painted ordinary household objects like knives and spoons and plates so that they're unrecognisable. And he lives in dread of the day that she'll suggest painting his portrait. And that day finally comes. <laughs> We usually do this on an iPhone, um, just to show off a bit more, but uh, the iPhone blew up, so we're back to very primitive technology. Now that's not to bring the iPhone into terrible disrepute. Previous to that, we had blown up two laptops. So this is laptop number three, and iPhone number one. Níl bjáin a gud ar ghiá ná ar ghilín a fhísíche O chúis le hálaín an fhó a fháistí Cúrant o'n sáil sa vratig a léir ar gúl Le hásarlíach da pacalíptach da húl An glimach a fúrish e siop an Atlantig in é Tá sé chó flán bhí le gort ar áistí O dáhrig an ádúr e ísge fiúchta da hálaíachta Gwyl tu lankish an dúchish da chrúbin nieta Ta spún óga is sganna a gnagige ar chlár níachain na cistinach Is áurain óil mar nélin ge dörte as bél na gopán O ní léan chíl a gud fasta, don sail sucar shasta A dórdig dékart is Isaac Newton
Grameen Lockwood, thank you.